Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our expert non-expert special guest James the Science Toolboy. Hello. As always we're wearing togas, our kylexes are full and today we're going to look at the significance of the Greek campaign to Xerxes. So previously on Stupid Ancient History we've continued charting the ever decreasing fortunes of Xerxes during his invasion of Greece in 418. He didn't start very well when the sea destroyed his bridge and that should have been a sign of things to come really. Yeah, I mean they were the omens. And however, after initial success at the Battle of Thermopylae, his armies were defeated on land and sea at Salamis and Plataea. Success. Yep. Success. At Thermopylae. <laughs> he just he couldn't catch a break, could he, basically? <laughs> so even his own best sailors ended up attacking their own. Yeah, it was just yeah. And how finally leaving his general Mardonius in Greece with three hundred thousand troops, fled back to Persia to avoid being stranded there. But he did get to burn Athens. Yeah. Twice. Yeah. That's small pretty... consolation. Was it yes, worth it? That's no mean feat. Well, you know. Probably not the second time. No. <laughs> so all things considered, this didn't go well. Um, yeah, it didn't really play out well for Xerxes, did it, this whole Greek campaign? <laughs> Absolutely not. So the invasion of Greece of Greece was at best kind of one hell of a gamble. Yeah. <laughs> and it didn't really pay yeah. off. Yeah, so if you look at it like in poker terms, Xerxes had definitely gone all in with his bet. Yeah. You know, the whole army of Asia was on the table. On a pair of twos or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well yeah. And the sheer size he thought the sheer size of his army would be enough to scare the Greeks into submitting. Yeah, but the problem is when betting so much if the others don't fold, you're in a very dangerous position very yeah. quickly. With your pair of two. <laughs> yeah. And th this is exactly what happened to Xerxes. The losses he suffered with his army of all Asia, they were, I mean, they were likely to be generational, looking at an entire generation of Persian men mm. dead. And it's something they really wouldn't have recovered from for decades. If at all. And I mean, is it a bit, if we say like an entire generation, is it a bit like the impact to put it into probably more modern terms, like the impact of World War One, yeah, where it wipes out a generation of men across yeah, Europe. Absolutely, and the aristocracy. Yeah. Because they they've all joined up straight away. Except for the first World War. Yeah. Joined up to go with Xerxes, thinking, oh, how hard can this be? Except for that one sensible bloke who stayed that behind. Sat <laughs> alone, going, now who's the fool? We know he's your hero, James. He is. He's the only one who's made any <laughs> sense through this. So he, even given that he is their god king, yeah. I'm guessing the Persians weren't happy with uh, Xerxes. <laughs> well, he uh, turns up on his he, own. He turns up without their dads, their yeah. brothers, their sons, etc. I think that that's a pretty fair assumption, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, the problem is we don't really have any significant Persian sources that document his return to Persia. No receipts, no. or <laughs> some lack thereof. No, and it makes sense really, because if a Xerxes you effectively have oversight of any official records and you know there's going to be very little positive coverage of the event, then you probably limit the amount of coverage that there was. He didn't take after his dad and carve it into a mountain. No, <laughs> I, I'm assuming that if people did actually make any coverage of the events, then they would have tried to wipe them out, mm. probably. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and it's not like Persia had a free press at the time. So no. Yeah, he's, he's not going to be writing too much about that. Um, that road he built to the, the west, there were yeah. people bobbing up and down there, just going like, it's all gone wrong. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, there, so there was no free press at the time, and although it's completely unrealistic to believe that everyone in Persia hearing of the deaths of numerous relatives would simply be thinking, this is fine. That went well. There will have been a backlash or a reaction, but we just don't know right. what it is from the Persian sources. Yes. Who, who possibly would have been left to really argue against him though. It's like presumably the young, the old and the women, the women. who are left. His mum, Atossa. Oh, Atossa. She's quite formidable. Yeah, <laughs> but there's, there's no, regardless of who we can speculate, would have been not very happy. There's no kind of Persian record of how his return is received in terms of right, okay. what the people do really when he gets yeah. back. So we just don't know. We, I mean, we do know, if nothing else, it, it was disastrous, but he still he didn't lose the throne. I was about to say I was about, like there was a massive revolution. I was about to ask did, did his does 
like dynasty survive. Yeah, okay. yeah, he continues to rule for at least another fifteen years. So he's done he, he, quite well. So he out. doesn't get another mad idea. His mum doesn't put another mad idea in his head to go off and fight someone. Well, no, because other things happen. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> <laughs> so you're just saying we basically don't know what happened when the Persians, presumably, were quite upset with uh, Xerxes. Not quite. All right. So on, is, hey, Herodotus. No, no. Not Herodotus. There's oh. another Greek source, I know, um, which is a play that actually does depict Xerxes' return to court. Okay. A play? How how accurate are we thinking that will be? Well, probably not completely reliable. <laughs> a Greek play at that. But yeah. like, like with anything that's more kind of literature based, what you can do is you can take aspects of it yeah. and think, well, it gives you some kind of an idea of what they might have thought. And the play is called The Persians, and it was written by Aeschylus. Okay. okay. So, I mean, again, he's really interesting as well. The reason Aeschylus is an interesting source is that he himself, almost 100% certain, he was a veteran of the Battle of Salamis. Okay. So he, he lived through the war. He actively took part in the war, from what we know. And certainly when it's first performed, there will have been many veterans of the Persian Wars who were still alive if not in his audience. Right, so if it was inaccurate, they probably would if have If it was wildly ridiculous, it would not have gone down very well with his audience. And right. It okay. certainly wouldn't have survived. So it can lead us to a sort of contemporary view of kind of remembrance of the invasion, yeah. even if it is a very kind of Athenian Greek one. So if this includes like Xerxes' return to Persia, what... Like, what's the scope of the play? Is it just... just Xerxes returns to Persia. That's it? Yeah. Okay. So, again, it may well be complete Greek fantasy, speculation. It may be that he's based this on stories he's heard. But, yeah, it's a play about Xerxes' really return to Greece. A Persian, yeah. not Greece. <laughs> Don't go back there, Xerxes. No, no, that's the last place he's going. So what does this play say about uh, Xerxes? Or is right. he full sex rex at this point? Well, he's a bit of neither. <laughs> so the play fits into your classic Greek structure of tragedy. It's got a chorus, it's all set in the Persian court when Xerxes arrives. There's lots of wailing and moaning and lamenting. Um, and the play starts with the Persian court, who are the chorus, not knowing what's happened. They don't know how it's all been going but they're still kind of lamenting their missing men. They're missing their sons and brothers and husbands. Right, okay. So we've got a little choice extracts. So it says, but when will they return, Xerxes our king, and all his gold-clad armament, our hearts heaving our breasts, clamoring prophetic fears, the flower of Asian youth left home, and none runner nor rider brings us word of them. So where, where are, where's everyone? Yeah, no and one's telling us what's going on. Things like the flower of Asia. Yeah. It really emphasises like the sheer size of this army. You left with a million people, where are they? Yeah, <laughs> and then the next bit. So it says, well here, each Persian wife longing for him, she sped, armed to the fierce campaign, sprinkling her empty bed with tender tears in vain, weeps out her lonely life. So Aww. it's suitably tragic and yeah. lots of sad Persian thinking, where's my husband? Just He's crying gone. myself to sleep. Yeah, so this continues for a bit. And then, just for you, James, a tosser, Xerxes' mother, turns up. Oh, she's in it. Yeah, of course she is. Um, and she turns up because she's had a terrible series of dreams, obviously building up to the bad news. Yeah. More fucking dreams. Yeah. Um, so she explains she's had these terrible dreams and she's worried before finally a messenger comes and gives them the following message. Haven of ample wealth, one blow has overthrown your happy pride. The flower of all your youth is fallen to bring the first news of defeats and evil fate. Yet I must now unfold the whole disastrous truth. Persians, our country's fleet and army are no more. The shores of Salamis and all the neighboring coasts are strewn with bodies miserably done to death. So again, it's piling on the tragedy. Yeah. It's kind of, there's, it's really kind of sad. They're emphasizing the size of the Persian losses. Um, and yeah, they're just piling on the misery. Uh, but then he does, however, tell them that Xerxes, it's all right. 
Xerxes is still alive. I'm all, he's all right. Yeah. Everyone else, not I'm so I'm sure it's a massive relief to everyone. So far, this play sounds like a barrel of laughs. <laughs> well, it is a tragedy, although at this point, it takes a strange turn, which can be seen as kind of darkly comic. Okay. The ghost of Darius appears. Awesome. <laughs> what does he have to say for well, himself? <laughs> Darius appears and begins to pretty much just sass out Xerxes' plans to a tosser. So we All get, right. yeah, we get a sassy ghost dad coming to basically have a go. Fair enough. Yeah, that's just what you want when you come back from Persia, isn't it? I've just lost a. From Greece. I've just had an embarrassing defeat in Greece. Come over, my dead dad's having a cop at me. So we've got some examples. So Darius and Atossa have a little chat, as they do. She's not seen him for a while, he's been dead for 10 years. Um, so Taylor with two voices. So we start with Darius, who says, But how? By stroke of pestilence or civil war. Atossa replies, No, but near Athens our whole army was destroyed. Tell me which of my sons campaigned so far afield. Xerxes, whose rashness emptied Asia of its men. Poor fool! Was it by land or sea he attempted this? Both. He, he advanced two fronted to a double war. So he's really so sticky. He's, he's really not happy. Who is this fool? <laughs> Uh, and then he chips in with our wretched son to lose so fine an allied force. <laughs> so he's really, it's not going Xerxes' way. It's Everyone's not. cross with him. His dad's come back from the grave to shout at him. Shout at him, even though technically it was Darius's plan as well. It was his plan, and he asked, he's asking which of my sons did this. He picked Xerxes to be his, his yeah. successor, so he's really only got himself to blame well, for this. Well, no, he's got Xerxes to blame. Yeah. So after a bit of sassing Xerxes out from beyond the grave. <laughs> he disappears, he goes back to the afterlife to be angry. Um, and then Xerxes enters. Oh, okay. In rags. Of course so they really emphasise he's like, he probably wouldn't have turned up in rags. He escaped with his retinue of helmets. Yeah. It's almost like he just comes in bedraggled and then there's much more wailing and lamenting the loss and everyone's sad and Darius is Still not happy. And I assume a tosser isn't either. Not really. <laughs> uh, so this play tells us that Darius came back from the dead to have a go at, well, about Xerxes to a tosser. Yeah. yeah. And it's completely true. Obviously not. Obviously, not, 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 not. yeah. It's, it's a complete fabrication. But it does give you an insight into how the Greeks felt about the war. So it's, it's a mixture of kind of sadness at the great losses. But with an added bit of, don't forget we won, fun poking at Xerxes, but as an individual rather than the Persians yeah. as a whole. Yeah. Have, and we've got the sassy ghost dad. So we can imagine if the Greeks are feeling this bad about this, then, well, tell. Well, given that the Greeks obviously seem to acknowledge that they've had terrible losses, um, and the terrible losses kind of befell the Persian Empire, which is not obviously their side, so you think, well, why are they that bothered? Mm. Then it's not hard to speculate that the Persians must have obviously felt pretty bad about oh, what had happened. I think we happened. can say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they weren't very happy with kind of what had gone down. No, but I mean, like I said, either way, there's something of a kind of blind spot regarding Xerxes' return and his no army. Yeah. Quite noticeably, there's a lack of information. Maybe everyone was just too depressed to write anything. <laughs> well... Or too tired if they've been fighting. And they managed to get back. So is that all Xerxes does then? Sits about wailing about his losses and... Yeah, no, sadly there's a bit more. A bit more tragedy for Xerxes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it just goes from bad to worse for him. I started off these podcasts like thinking the Persians were going to do well. Yeah. You always back the wrong horse, don't you? You did it when we did roll. Well, you backed Mark Antony. Well, you thought he was a good one. I nah. didn't think you'd study losers, but apparently <laughs> that's not the case. Wherever there's a winner, there's a loser. I know, but you don't, you, don't, you don't pay attention to the winners. You made me study Cleopatra and now losers. We're all about making people feel better about themselves, Shane. That's yeah. what we're doing. So not poor old Xerxes. So. No. The problem he has is that they're feeling pretty cocky after the victories. The Greeks then decide that they're going to try and push the Persians 
even further back. Yeah, so in 477, the Athenians formed the Delian League, whose main purpose is to retake the Ionian Greek states from Persia and bring them back into Greek control or into the Greek world. So this isn't the Hellenic League anymore, so what's, no, no. what's, what's Sparta doing? Right, Sparta's having a bit of a crisis of its own at this moment. Not a party. Not a party, not <laughs> at all. Um, so this is definitely an Athenian plan. They basically see these Greek states as free real estate. Mm. You know, Xerxes is on the run, they've kicked the, Greek, the Persians out of Greece, so they're going to cross the sea and take all the Greek world back. Sparta, then, as well as not being too interested in expanding outside of their territory... They don't like to move. <laughs> no. They, they've had a bit of a problem with their general, their region, Porcinius. Oh, the, the, the uncle. The uncle. The owner yeah. So it turns out, while he was on campaign, he started basically having a pop at these Ionian Greeks, and they fell out with him quite badly. Okay. So they're, they're not fans of Sparta. But then it got even worse. So somehow, apparently, Porcinius ended up married to one of Xerxes' daughters or nieces. How does, he, how does that just happen? He was there. Right, okay. The lack of men. <laughs> Either way, so the story goes that Posnius goes back to Sparta where they notice something's up because he's wearing purple trousers. Is that purple unusual? Are, well, Spartans wearing trousers is unusual. Right, okay. Um, but purple's like this royal colour associated with Persia. They instantly clock on that Posnius has been taking bribes and hanging out with the Persians, so they condemn him to death. Right, so okay. he, he legs it, the Spartans chase after him, and knowing that the Spartans will never desecrate a temple, he hides in a temple. So mm -hmm. the Spartans don't go in and kill him, they just wall the temple up and leave him in to die. <laughs> that's amazing. I think that's a good way of dealing with someone you don't like, personally. You can't yeah. kill him, just brick him up. <laughs> so the Spartans, who are meant to be the best of Greece and they do no wrong, they're having a bit of an image crisis at the moment. Right, okay. So they brick him up in the temple, they go back home and go, right, let's sort our own stuff out, and yeah, other stuff can happen. So they're not involved in this pushing back of okay. the Persians. So, so, next so where are they at? Is other king and Leonidas' son okay now? Or? Yeah, they're all right, but they, yeah, they've had yeah. to do some DIY in the temple. Right, okay. <laughs> so if we think back to Athens and we think about the Delian League, under the general kind of ship of Cimon, Cimon, sorry, the grandson of Miltiades, the Athenians and their allies begin a campaign starting at the Hellespont and march marching south. So it's almost like going back to the Ionian Revolt, you know how this yeah. whole thing well, started? Yeah, how, where are the Ionians at in this, because I know they big shit all those messages in, like, yeah. you know. They, they're, they're happy to jump ship. They, 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 yeah. They'd be happy to go back oh, to Oh yeah, Greece. They, they've seen that Greece have won, Persia's not a threat anymore, they've seen no benefit. The Athenians are offering them democracy and you know, shiny gifts. All that good stuff. Yeah, all that good stuff's like, yeah, sick, we'll go with the winners. So everything's coming up Persia then. This is all going amazingly well. Nope. <laughs> so, by either 469 or 466 BC... Specific. Specific. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, the Greek forces defeat the Persians at the Battle of Eurymedon and force them to sign a peace treaty. By this time, however, Xerxes has lost the entire Ionian coast. So he's not only failed to expand the empire... He's shrunk it. He's shrunk it. He's <laughs> lost all these towns and these cities that have been part of the empire since the days of Cyrus. Right. But he doesn't have too long to mope about it because other things happen. Yeah, good things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? No. No. Absolutely not. So the following year, he is assassinated by the captain of his royal guards, a guy called Artabanus. He's murdered by his own immortals. Why? <laughs> well, <laughs> what? He, other than you know, probably getting their brothers and dads and stuff killed. Yeah, the, the, we're not. 100% sure, it may well just be, yeah, this is seen as the ultimate failure, Artabanus wants to get rid of him, maybe he wants to influence what happens next, because uh, some of the sources claim that Artabanus blamed one of Xerxes' sons, Darius, for the murder. So not his dad, he's, he's got a son, Darius. He's got a son called okay. Darius, and he persuades his other son, Artaxerxes, to kill him. Okay. Uh, Aristotle, however, claims that Artabanus killed Darius first, from a dis 
different hmm. disagreement um, before killing Xerxes himself. Okay. So there's lots of different speculations. However, none of the sources kind of accurate, accurately explain what happens to Artabanus after this. Although we can kind of safely assume that Artaxerxes, the surviving son, obviously doesn't let him get away with it. No, you killed my dad and possibly my brother. brother. Yeah, not having this. No. Yeah. So yeah, by 465, Xerxes has died. Oh. He's buried at Naxi Rustum with his dad. So oh, he didn't, he didn't, he shout at him he didn't build other. his own elaborate tomb. Well, there was one right next to it. Ah, oh, fair enough. So yeah, by 465, Xerxes is dead. That's the end of the four Persian kings we need to look at. Oh. And yeah, it's a sad time for Does Persia. Does it ever come up well for Persia? Briefly. Okay. So as we said at the start, we've, kind of, we've got to look at the significance of this Greek campaign on Xerxes and the Persians overall. I mean, the first and obvious point to make is this loss of resources is massive to Persia. Um, we started off saying they were the world's first superpower. Mm. They're not anymore. And like I said, it's the loss of a whole generation. It's going to take them a while to come Let's back from Build this. that up. So basically, for quite a long period then, they're not only weak, but they're also really kind of open to further attacks, I was going to ask, like, does, does anyone have a pop at them during this time? Well, yeah, the Greeks. Oh, right, The okay. Athenians do not stop. So there's, is, there's no one, like, whoever the Athenian king is, there's no one going, remember the Persians, and no, is there? No, I mean, the Athenians continue with the Delian League. They basically turn the Ionian coast into an Athenian empire. Right, okay. Um, and they really only stop hassling the Persians to fight Sparta. Lovely. And they do that for 50 years. So coming, coming back to the Greeks hate Greeks more than anyone else. Yes, absolutely. Um, and again, if we look at this kind of significance across all four of the kings, uh, Xerxes stands to be the only one of the four to actually shrink the empire. Mm. You know, Cambyses managed to expand the empire and he was mental. <laughs> you know, he'd at least had this good sense to capture Egypt before losing it. Yeah. Whereas Xerxes... It really doesn't put him in a good light, does it, at no. all? No. No. And then, again, if we look, I mean, to be f a bit fairer to Xerxes, though, it's, as we've seen, it's quite easy to spot this kind of Greek grandstanding over his campaign. Yeah. Um, and it is quite problematic that we only have Greek sources, really, because there's not an awful lot for Xerxes. There's nowhere near as do much archaeological or document evidence as there was for... Darius, so we've got to go with the Greeks, and obviously they're saying, <laughs> we, "We won, won. <laughs> stupid Persians." We won angry. a lot and continuously. <laughs> yeah, but he's really. also he's also in a really unenviable position, isn't he? That he's got an awful lot to live up to. Yeah. So the empire is already quite big. It's already been expanded. Is the kings that have come before him have got a really strong, powerful reputation, and he's been he's almost being forced into something. It's yeah. in an impossible situation. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't, I don't want to join the long list of people who blame history on women, but this is all really a Tosser's fault, isn't it? <laughs> he, he, he didn't want this. He just wanted to get Egypt back and that was it. And she was one like, no, go, go to Greece, go to Greece. But on the flip side, you could say she's the one that's, that's basically got the balls, aren't she? She's the one that's saying, go and fight. And I he's think, just like, no, no. I think, no, said that no. as well. I think yeah, after exactly. a million people dying, you can probably think, I could do without some balls in that regard. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, no, poor, Xerxes is in a tough position. You can argue Cyrus was so good at conquering because he could expand. Yeah, it was all there, was, right for there was places to go. Yeah, Xerxes didn't have that opportunity. Because we, we talked about that before, like a kind of, kind of just, got wedged in, didn't they? There yeah. was nowhere north, nowhere south, nowhere east. There was Greece. Greece. Yeah. And Greece, it turns out, was not easy, as easy to capture as they thought. But what is worth pointing out in terms of significance, not necessarily the Greek campaign, Xerxes, like we said, did continue to rule for another 15 years after the defeat. Do we know much about that rule? Well, no, because it's all the Greeks that's happened. Yeah. But the fact that he's able to take this massive defeat in his stride says something about him or it says something about the nature of the god king yeah. that Darius has set up that it's so ingrained and he's done such a good job of establishing strong rule in mm. Persia 
that even if you lose a million men in Greece... You're still the God King. You're still the God King and no one's really ready to challenge you until it's the captain of your own guard. And it seems from the sources it's more of a personal dispute rather than sicking you now. Does, um, does that idea of the God King continue after Xerxes? Yeah, all Persian kings at this point right, continue okay. the idea of the God it, King. Are they all like held to that regard? Like, you know, yeah. Regardless of what they do wrong, you're the God King. Yeah, they, they still have this air of divinity around them and the way that the Persians bow to them. We'll do more about that in Alexander the Great, don't worry. Okay. We'll get you I, 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 I was worried. <laughs> it's, more, it's more about the strength of kingship, isn't it, as an institution? Yeah, the institution rather than the man. Yeah, right. rather than the individual. And that's quite telling. And that's, that's something that you can, you can kind of plant that with our royal family, can't you? Similar kind of, there's lots of individuals in the royal family oh, that people what they do. don't Some like, people but then there's still that like, like, are there oh, some royal family, there's still really that institutional people somewhere aspect. with plates of Xerxes' <laughs> face on them. <laughs> <laughs> A tea <me>. towel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's that, you're absolutely right, it's this institution of kingship that particularly Darius has spent time crafting before he went and attacked the Scythians. Xerxes has benefited from it and, to be fair, has kept him in power for some time until he sadly murdered. Aww. But either way, it's fair he to say... probably had it coming. <laughs> yeah. The, the Greek campaign was significantly bad for Xerxes. So there you have it. Our quick look at the significance of the impact of the Greek campaign to Xerxes. Our last Persian podcast. I don't, I don't think I'd take any more Persian cock-ups. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to love what comes next. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for listening to all 30 episodes, if indeed you have. We hope they've been useful. As always, leave us a comment below. And until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.